You call the shots and ask anything next on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Tonight's theme is Ask Anything, where we work to answer whatever medical questions you may have. Our Ask Anything shows always brings in many calls from you at home and we enjoy the interaction and do our best to provide you with honest science-based answers. I'm going to challenge you, see if you can test our, our, our capacity, Bill. Let's see if it works out they can stump the doc tonight. Joining me tonight is to field your questions is Dr. Bill Schiffermiller, the governor of the American College of Physicians in Nebraska. Uh, Bill, tell us a little bit about uh, where, you, what got you into medicine, and what in the world is the governor of the American <laughs> College of Physicians, and why did it, why are you here? You're from Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, well, it's not raining here. It's raining yeah. in Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rick, I was uh, I grew up in a small town as you did, and my father was a family practitioner in that town, uh, so I got to know in the, Nebraska. In Nebraska, yeah, Ainsworth, Nebraska, Sand Hills of Nebraska, just yeah. south of South Dakota, by yeah, the way. Right. Lots of interaction with athletes from s Southern South Dakota. Yeah, uh, and I got used to the lifestyle, and I saw uh, how much he enjoyed doing what he was doing, and how rewarding it was to him. And uh, I was decent in science, and the University of Nebraska Medical Center was foolish enough to let me in. Oh, yes, uh, so. <laughs> Uh, that's how I got there. Uh, and the governorship of the Nebraska chapter of the American College of Physicians, uh, similar to your position for South Dakota, uh, is a uh, uh, very gratifying experience, a wonderful organization. Uh, uh, I couldn't be happier to have represented them. Uh, it's, uh, and so uh, what kind of an organization is the American College of Physicians? It's uh, internists, uh, both uh, general internists, as you and I are, and all the subspecialties of internal medicine. Like uh, cardiology, rheumatology, infectious disease, infectious disease, yeah. everything. Uh, all represented by uh, the one organization, the largest specialty organization of physicians in the United States. Uh, and uh, this is our 100th year anniversary. Right, so. this is great. So you're the governor of, uh, and. We, we have a general uh, person who uh, kind of looks over our, our, uh, our chapter and your chapter together, Chris Ram, and it's a joy to work with her. And, and Kansas chapter as well. She also yeah. co coordinates the Kansas chapter. She lives in Sioux Falls. So. You guys brought her to us. Yes. We Thank did. you very much. You're very welcome. It's our pleasure because she's a wonderful uh, leader. So. Uh, now you've practiced, you know, some 30, 35 years in Omaha, and you've changed your role a little bit. What's happening now? Uh, still practicing general internal medicine, but I also uh, work for Methodist Health System as their chief medical officer, which is sort of the, uh, the physician representative on the administrative staff of the hospital and the health system. Yeah, so you're a an administrator now. Is that, how do you like that? Uh, it's uh, interesting. Uh, physicians always say it sort of with the tone that you said. <laughs> yeah. always makes me feel <laughs> a little bad about it. Uh, but uh, uh, it gives you an opportunity to look at all the different specialties, what their needs are, what their new procedures and technologies are. Uh, so it uh, exposes you to a lot of interesting things in medicine. So one more step in the, this whole myriad of opportunities of practicing medicine. I mean, it's part of practicing in a different way. Exactly. So in your practice, what would be uh, one of the most challenging things that you've run into? I, I, I would almost say diabetes is the hardest thing that I take care of every day, but what, what would be yours? Yeah, diabetes would be one of them. I think, uh, oh, things like chronic abdominal pain, uh, chronic gastrointestinal complaints, uh, uh, headache, that? fatigue. Those are hard ones that you're throwing at. Those are no Those fun are, for, just... for us or for the patient who's afflicted by them. Because we don't have good answers sometimes. Right. I mean, every once in a while we have a good answer. You know, uh, and, and there are certain diseases that we have great answers for, but those are tough ones. Um, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about diabetes. There's been a lot of changes about diabetes, and I want to throw in a think about it now. This is a great top, time to give us a call. 
So uh, what about the uh, issue of diabetes and holding off the insulin uh, challenge, staying on orals, keeping from starting uh, insulin? Uh, do you think that uh, we're able to do that more now with the armamentarium that we have, and or do, are we waiting too long before we start insulin? I think uh, you're able to do it more effectively than you used to because we have more classes of medicines that we can give to people. However, I would have to say that the uh, primary way to prevent uh, progression in the disease process that requires insulin is uh, exercise, which we were talking about a, a little bit earlier, and weight loss. I like to tell diabetics that uh, you know, they've got diabetes because of their genes and because of their age and because of their weight, and there's only one of them they can do anything about. Right. But the problem is, is I, I think there, it, it's hard for people to do anything about that one, too. Oh, it's terribly hard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the New England Journal study says 30% will lose weight with the best methods. After a year, 30% have kept it off of that 30%. And then after five years, they're all back to the, I mean, and that's not everybody. I don't think that per, is a perfect representation of the whole story, but it's certainly one of the biggest challenges. I, I like to tell my colleagues that I think it's only somebody with an obsessive compulsive personality that will take weight off and keep it off like a physician. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's very hard for someone uh, who's not used to exercising and doesn't remember it positively from their youth to make it a habit. I kind of think that the, the thing that they really can do, whether they lose weight or not, the huge difference is that exercise component. Oh, absolutely. And every, almost everybody can walk. Yeah. Uh, and if you can walk a regular amount every day and gradually increase that distance, uh, you know, get a half an hour anyway for sure every day. And your, your uh, Glucose tolerance is improved by exercise even if you don't lose weight. Right. So you're kind of getting a double dip with uh, exercise. And not only that, it, it, it improves your tone, it helps your heart, helps your lungs, helps your mind, uh, strengthens your bones. I didn't bring my shoes or I'd be... Uh, we'd be running right now, <laughs> wouldn't right. we? So it's interesting, when we were in Boston at the meeting a couple, three weeks ago, what were... What, tell us about what we did one 5.45 in the morning meet, uh, uh, time of, at our meeting. Yeah, we uh, ran in Boston. I haven't spent a lot of time in Boston, but we ran down to the finish line of the Boston Marathon, and uh, uh, we did it in honor of Tom Braithwaite, previous governor of the American College of Physicians for South Dakota, who has passed away. Who is, who's been on this show, a dear friend, terrible loss. Right. Makes me feel very sad. Miss him. Diagnosing a medical condition is not always a black and white, yes or no situation. It is often a detective story with several twists and turns and blind alleys. But with proper sleuthing, that includes listening to the patient, success can be attained. About six or seven years ago, I had a social friend who I noticed that they had a cough at a social engagement, and eventually that led to an office visit. So she'd had it for about seven years, and um, the cough had been increasing in severity, and it started to interfere with her exercise program. It remained not productive, um, and it was uh, something that because of its lifestyle involvement, uh, she'd elected to come and do an appointment. Now, we have a very long list of things that we do with cough. We talk about drugs. There's a drug called lisinopril that causes a cough. We had a evaluation about reflux, and she had some symptoms that suggested reflux. Um, we have asthma symptoms, and we spent some money doing a spirom spirometry, which was perfectly normal, um, and really didn't get a good handle on the cough on the first uh, visit. I asked her to give me a diary of the cough, see if we could see if there's any pattern. She returned with the diary. Now, it was interesting that the diary said that I cough more in the afternoon. Sometimes I cough in the evening, and rarely I cough at night, and I almost never cough in the morning. She also noted, because we had asked, that she does have occasional burping and belching, so we get a little GI symptom. 
And this is the time I ask her, well, where's this cough coming from? She said, the cough's coming from right here, and it, and it feels fuzzy. I said, that's interesting. I said, do you feel like your throat's closing? She said, um, I, I do have a sensation in my throat. I said, well, that's interesting. I think we probably should do some skin testing and see if it's something you're breathing in. She didn't have any dogs or cats, anything like that. There definitely wasn't anything. But since it was during the day and she was going around to friends, maybe there was an association. There was no real reason at that moment to say that we were going to do anything inhalants and do some foods. We thought, you know, maybe foods. So I said, well, is there any other like diarrhea or anything like that? No, there isn't. Um, any previous issues with food before that make you, that you don't, you avoid like spicy foods, that kind of thing. She said, well, yeah, I have modified my diet over the last seven years. She said, I um, avoid spicy foods, tomatoes and that kind of thing, because it seems to bother my stomach, which gives us a little hint there's a GI part to what's going on. And then she said, and I've gone a higher protein diet, I eat a lot of tuna fish. Fine. So we sit her down, do skin testing. We include some foods that we include a lot of times, like milk and egg and peanut and soy and walnuts and wheat. But of course, I threw tuna on because she said, gee, I'm eating a lot more tuna. And uh, so the skin test came back, and she was phenomenally allergic to tuna. And it, I, the point here is, is that allergy is the detective work. You never know where it's going to lead you, and you've got to listen closely to what the patient says. Thank you, Dr. Luzier. That's a great case, and it's a case of uh, the value of taking a careful history and listening, and listening to what the patient says. Uh, you have any examples or thoughts about where your history has really led you to a kind of a, uh, a, a challenging case? Uh, un unfortunately, Rick, I usually find out that my history wasn't good enough when someone else figures it out or the patient <laughs> tells me <laughs> what the real cause is. But I do remember one specific highway patrolman uh, in Nebraska who came down to see me with a combination of cough and uh, rash hives and uh, he'd had it for years and uh, uh, we went through the whole differential never found out what it was and uh, I'm driving between Omaha and Ainsworth where uh, my parents lived and I have a, a light out yeah. and the highway patrolman stops me in the middle part of the sand hills uh, and uh, recognizes me and we get to talking he says you know doc uh, I moved out of my trailer house uh, and there was uh, a bunch of asbestos in that trailer house when the next inhabitant uh, moved there and I haven't had a cough or hives since I moved out of that trailer house. And that probably is the most common way I find out the patient <laughs> tells me what the allergen was in the case of this patient. Yeah. To, wow. And, uh, you know, a cough is such an interesting thing because it can be from so many different things. I mean, you know, it can be a low-grade asthma. It can be uh, an infection. It can be, you know, maybe you're a farmer and, and there is something in the hog house that's bothering you. Or it can be chronic lung disease from smoking, but then there's that heartburn thing where reflux, or even they don't even have heartburn, but when they lay down at night, food rolls up there and it hits that vocal cords and it does. So this one on tuna fish, I've never heard of tuna fish. That was great. Yeah. We've got questions. 73-year-old woman from Iowa following a ruptured Baker's cyst located behind the knee. What are the post symptoms? How long does the pain and swelling last and what's the treatment? So a Baker's cyst. So she had it fixed, Rick? I think she... she had a ruptured Baker's cyst and uh, I think it was repaired. Yeah, post-operative. Uh, so. uh, 
you know, if you repair a Baker's cyst, there's only the post-operative healing pain. She really shouldn't have long-term problems with that. I would guess... What is a Baker's cyst? A, a Baker's cyst is a sort of a hernia of a joint space. People get them in the wrist most commonly, often due to degenerative arthritis. In the case of a Baker's cyst, uh, must have been associated with Baker's kneeling or something at yeah. one time, uh, but it's behind the knee and uh, it's a, a joint space filled uh, little defect bleb on the uh, joint space in the knee. Uh, and my experience has been, uh, first of all, that they're mildly uh, symptomatic until they rupture and then they're very symptomatic for a period of time after they rupture. But unfortunately, they tend to reaccumulate fluid and the hole that ruptured uh, uh, seals up and they get recurrent symptoms so most of the time they have to have them repaired and my experience has been it's only been a couple weeks until they're they get better. well yeah, yeah. If, but if they're there and they're really symptomatic because they're bulging sometimes you can go tie it off but the problem is they'll yeah. reoccur because it's inflammatory process in the knee yeah. but when they rupture suddenly they have a hot lower leg and it can look like an infection a cellulitis it can look like a clot and uh, and then it can be a Baker's cyst. That's the differential that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and if you're not careful, the orthopedist will give them uh, uh, Lovenox or uh, an anticoagulant and make it worse. <laughs> because they think it's a blood clot and it isn't. Right. Yeah. 67-year-old man from Sioux Falls, what are the latest methods of diagnosing and treating pancreatic cancer? Well, uh, pancreatic cancer is an unfortunate disease. Uh, it is somewhat hereditary. There aren't any good screening tests for pancreatic cancer. Almost always when it's discovered, it's either discovered because of abdominal pain and an ultrasound or a CT scan shows a mass. It's only rarely completely resectable for cure at that point. Uh, it's it one of the places we haven't been successful yet, I would say. Right, I mean, it's, if you see a skin cancer, you can see it. If you've got a brain tumor or a pancreatic cancer, you don't see it until it's too late sometimes. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, I think though, there's new hope because there's been some stuff about injecting cancers with viruses that have been somewhat successful. They're on the cutting edge of, of uh, working this up, but I'm not uh, knowledgeable about it at this point. Right? And I think you and I both are at this point where we're, we send them off to somebody who really knows exactly. a lot. 55-year-old woman from Sioux Falls, I developed severe chest pain requiring hospitalization, IV pain medicines. The diagnosis was doxycycline-induced pericarditis. Please discuss uh, this. Doxycycline-induced pericarditis. Have you ever heard of that? No. I have, because this was my case. <laughs> and uh, I, let's look at the telestrator here. She developed uh, pericarditis. That, in other words, the lining that goes around the heart, the heart swings in this, and uh, and uh, I thought that it was doxycycline induced because I started her two weeks earlier on doxycycline. The other thing is that I did a a, a level of Coxsackie virus uh, titer, and she, her Coxsackie titer was elevated, and so it may not have been doxycycline; it may have been. Uh, a, a virus induced uh, pericarditis. I wonder if you, I wonder if the virus titers would change and give you some if you were curious. Right. As long as it goes away, you don't care. I, today, I ordered the second set of titers. So you do acute and convalescent. In other words, take it when you've got it. Oh, it's elevated. Now we take it two weeks later. And if it's sky high, then we, we've nailed it. If it hasn't changed, then I'm going to call it doxycycline. <laughs> so, you can write a paper. I could write a paper. Uh, that's great. Uh, female, her friend who has very cold and red hands and feet, do the docs know what could be the cause? Red hands, cold hands and feet. Very common complaint. Either uh, uh, blue or red hands, either cold or hot hands, uh, sweaty or dry hands. Uh, and uh, I suspect that most of these are related to uh, differences in the autonomic nervous system in various uh, individuals. Uh, 
I think the vast majority of people, it's not a significant issue in their lives. It's more an aggravation than uh, something that's going to be progressive or dis uh, disabling. Uh, there might be uh, occasional rheumatological conditions that might produce the the Raynaud's kind the, of yeah either Raynaud's or even uh, uh, red rash uh, especially on the hands might right. reflect some uh, collagen vascular disease uh, but most of these aren't aren't Raynaud's they're no. just they're just autonomic dif differences in humans aren't they yeah uh, do you treat these much or do you do much with them or what do you do mostly reassurance yeah. don't worry about it Make sure there's nothing else that's sneaking up on us. Yeah. Uh, quick one, 70 year old woman, Brandon Collar has a brother with low platelet count, white count of one. He is uh, a 72 year old pre-diabetic. He's had a fever of 102 since Sunday. Any ideas of what these symptoms might be doing? Well, that's a potential serious condition. Uh, why he has two of the three main components of the bone marrow that are dysfunctional. Uh, that can be medication, it can be uh, chronic uh, degenerative processes in the bone marrow, especially somebody 72, myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, it could be even a primary bone marrow problem that uh, uh, is uh, going to require uh, treatment. I think that this, this person uh, needs a diagnosis. I would think that that diabetic uh, uh, is uh, not related to this uh, right. problem with the bone marrow. They need if they're if they're not in with the doctor right now. They need to be exactly. here soon. All right. So, as we age, the aches and pains of life may require a continuing use of painkillers to help us live the lifestyle we'd like. But those drugs carry a new new concerns for long-term use. What's key is trying to find out for each patient what's really going on with them and what their pain problem is because figuring out the cause of the pain is really important in determining the type of treatment that's going to be appropriate including pain medications because they're targeted for different types of pain whether the pain is related to nerves or muscles there's different treatment choices so the assessment is first of all is pain present which can be a real problem with elders that are not able to communicate and report their pain so finding out if it's there and finding out how bad it is or how severe it is, because that also helps determine the kind of approach that's needed for, for treatment. And then the quality of pain is what helps us determine if the pain might be from muscles or bones or from nerves. So asking them, describe what your pain feels like. And a common pain from muscle is aching, soreness, um, but from nerve pain it might be piercing, tingling, burning, stabbing. And so the way that patients describe their pain help us to recognize what might be underlying cause. How do we know when people are hurting that have cognitive impairment, particularly dementia, and can't self-report? And we've put together um, a, an approach that can be used. So first of all, of people that have cognitive impairment, um, mild and moderate, many of them can still report having pain, so we don't discount it. And self-reported pain is always our first line. We want to find out what the patients are experiencing and tell us. But for those that can't self-report, we look at other things, like what diagnoses do they have that we know are painful in people that can tell us. So for example, do they have a history of a fracture? Um, do they have a history of low back pain? Do they have a history of diabetes that might have led to a neuropathy? Um, so we look to see what's going on with them. What we recommend is if you are suspicious that these behaviors are caused by pain, then treat them as if they're pain and see how the patient response, responds. So we start with an analgesic trial, low dose, even acetaminophen has been found to be very helpful in improving pain in that population. So you treat and then you observe to see are the behaviors any better? You know, do they decrease when we treat the problem and the behaviors if they're pain related. And if they do respond well, then we can move forward assuming, okay, it looks like this is pain, now what's going to be the best treatment plan? And that may be drugs, it may be non-drug strategies. We have a, quite a large array of different things that we can use. So 
that's that's tough. Let's say you have a, a demented person, you know, who has Alzheimer's disease, and you're trying to figure out what to do to help them. I mean, they can't, they can't answer you. They can't give you a good answer. Uh, that that's a very big challenge. What what's your take on that? Well, I, I thought she did a great job of explaining it. I think that. Uh, uh, if, first of all, if they, if they can't tell you what's bothering them, it's insomnia, it's agitation, uh, it's restlessness uh, that uh, cues you in that something isn't right. If you can't figure out that they, uh, you know, they're constipated or they uh, have a urinary tract infection or they, you know, got a rash somewhere or something like that, I think her uh, suggestion that uh, you try an analgesic to see if it helps the situation is yeah. probably the best course. Right. I lean on the family a lot because uh, they're hovering and they went, they figure I'm going to have a magical answer and I, I really know what's happening with the patient. Sometimes I don't, particularly if they don't, they're not talking to me. They, the family, knows that patient is sensing something's different. And Absolutely. Yeah. Family feedback is important. And the nurse, the nurse who's taking care of that patient in that nursing home. I just, I lean on that person very heavily. You know, it's very important for, for me to listen to the nursing uh, feedback or the nurse's aide or anybody who, who's, who's inputting that person. So uh, the problem though is oftentimes we, we, these people are on a lot of medications. Uh, what is your thinking about polypharmacy? Do you sense that, that uh, that we're on too many medicines nowadays, and particularly the nursing home patients, or for sure. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, people come in with complaints, and they, they and or their family are looking for a solution to that complaint, and you attempt to give them some relief by giving them a medicine, and they may or may not get relief, but they never stop having medicine. <laughs> and you end up with, honestly, I mean, the screen said 87% of patients over 65, of, of, of persons over age 65, ha take at least one. I would say that's an underestimate uh, in my experience. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the vast majority of nursing home patients, uh, if you periodically did a uh, perusal of their medications and tried to withdraw those that aren't definitely uh, uh, critical uh, that uh, you would be doing them all a favor. Yeah, I, I think we, we, we overdo it. But if you're diabetic, you're probably on two or three pills. And if you've got some heart failure, you're on three more. And then, of course, there's all the as-needed medicines that people add, you know, well, if they're constipated, they can have this, and if they've got, you know, it, yes. and their list goes too long. Yeah, I agree with you. <clears throat> for, for pain, uh, and there's, you know, people give acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, and, they, and now we've learned that there's all these side effects with the non-steroidals like ibuprofen and naproxen and so on and so forth. So people have turned to using the narcotics more. Uh, is that a good or a bad thing, do you think? Uh, I think you have to be very circumspect uh, with narcotics. What you're, what you're looking for is the person functioning at the highest level. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes in nursing facilities that's not very high. Uh, but those people, it uh, doesn't take much narcosis to bring them right down, bring them right down to the point where they are, they're really not functioning. So. I try, to, I try to find a way to give them some relief and maintain their function so that they can, if they are, remain ambulatory, they can talk to their families, uh, but you want them to be able to sleep. I think that uh, at key. nighttime, if they have trouble at night, uh, you really do have to give them something. So, right. yes, I give them something and I try to give them the lowest dose possible and uh, uh, I try to stay below the threshold of uh, causing them to be dysfunctional. And I like to have family members say, call me on the, on the idea of, can we be on less medicine? And, and review that periodically. So this is a call out to people who have family members that may be on too many medicines. Talk to your doctor, say, does he or she really need to be on all these pills? Can you cut them back any? Uh, it's amazing. Sometimes when they get sick, they come in the hospital, you take the opportunity to just strip, strip it all the way down to the basics as if you can, and then you send them back 
on those strip <laughs> right. level. Uh, we have a, another question, 67-year-old from Sioux Falls. Dizziness when I get up from lying just on my back. Originally started on my left side, but now I can sleep on both right and left sides without a problem. Have been to a doctor who did Epley procedure three times with no correction. Went to a chiropractor too, still having a problem. Dizziness when they get up. Uh, let's talk about the Epley maneuver. This, what is it? Uh, well, I think we have to go back and talk briefly about benign positional vertigo, which okay. uh, is the labyrinthine apparatus uh, inside our head attached to our ears that keeps us in balance as we get older, uh, can get dysfunctional, and it, uh, it gets dysfunctional uh, because there's uh, uh, a part of it that has to do with not turning but moving that requires a little uh, ball in a sphere and it gets rusty and some of the uh, rust gets up in the canals and stimulates the apparatus and makes you feel like you're moving. So uh, a ball can be in in here, right. So, so this is the outer ear, you know, here's your ear. And then this is the tympanic membrane, this is the middle ear, and this is the inner ear. And so the ball can, can, can get Keep it. your day job, Doug. Yeah, I should be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the ball gets floating around in here, and it's bumping against all these hairs. And you end up uh, in this semicircle canal, circular canal, um, is causing the problem. And then the Epley procedure is an attempt to move your head in such a way that you move that uh, ball uh, back into its normal position and the uh, dizziness is relieved. And that's effective about 85 percent of the time, but not always. And uh, if it doesn't uh, result in an improvement, you may need to have some more sophisticated testing of your inner ear function to make sure that you made the right diagnosis in the first place. Right, there's a bunch of other reasons for dizziness too. I mean, the, you know, the back of the brain, the cerebellum can get messed up and a yeah. uh, variety of other things. But this is one that we can actually fix. Yeah, and very common. Yeah, and it's really pr quite common. Uh, I would keep trying the Epley maneuver. I think if you can look it up on the internet, go through it carefully, repeat it exactly as it says. I mean, don't lean on the doctor to do it. Do it yourself. See if you can find because there, if it works, it's such a magical thing. Yeah. Fifty-seven-year-old woman from Elkton, caller suffers from benign positional vertigo. Oh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. What causes? it to occur, what makes the calcium float around the ear. We just talked about that. It's good. We had two questions on that. Anything that you want to add on that last one, the, the benign position? Uh, I, I would say that it tends to go away on its own. It usually only lasts a week or two or three or whatever, and then it goes away on its own. And it can come back, you know, six weeks, six months, six years later, but a little patience, it'll often uh, go away. Um, I like the idea of uh, if, if, if the Epley doesn't work, you try to extinct it by sitting on the side of the bed, feet on the ground, lay your head all the way down to the left, wait five seconds, sit up again, wait five seconds, lay all the way down to the right, wait five seconds, and repeat that five times, a couple times a day, and sometimes people get relief with that. Yep. 60-year-old man has been having a hearing loss in one ear. We're, we're doing ears. That's not right. Over the last couple of years, I've, had, I've seen a rapid loss to the point that I can almost hear nothing uh, out, out of it. It feels full, and I have felt uh, that there is an infection because it's producing a mild, small amount of oil-type substance out of that ear. I've told my GP about this. He says that there's no infection, orders an ear wash. This does nothing. Is there anything or anybody that can I do to stop and fix this problem? Well, the, uh, if indeed you almost have no hearing in that ear, it's not likely to be an obstructive process in the canal or even fluid behind the drum. Uh, if the hearing is almost completely gone, there's probably a nerve problem uh, and uh, a little testing might uh, find the cause of the hearing. Unfortunately, uh, oftentimes, uh, that uh, fairly rapid loss of hearing uh, is uh, not easily corrected, but it, it'd be a good idea to know for sure what it is. Though. Right, I, I think that's the time to go to the ENT. You've been to your primary care doc, ask him, this, in this case, to, to send you to, to, 
ears, nose, and uh, uh, ears, nose, and throat specialist. I do. Th you know, you can test it by putting a, vibe, a, yeah. a tuning fork in your head, and if you hear it louder on that side, that means that is something you could do. If you hear it less on that side, then it's that nerve loss. That's right. So get a tuning fork. Here's a here's a. Only dry. Dr. Holman myself even remember how to do, do that. a tuning fork. <laughs> you got to be graduate of the School of Medicine in 19. You know we don't want to say. So here's an ear, a picture of an ear. Yeah. You want to draw <clears throat> anything? Does that give well, you any picture? The, it doesn't have the. the it doesn't have the semicircular canals, but uh, this is the. Uh, yeah, do that. That's the eardrum right here. Fluid behind the eardrum. <coughs> uh, so this is where wax would be. And uh, the eardrum can have a hole in it or it can uh, be uh, stiff because the bones get uh, calcified behind it or there can be fluid behind the eardrum uh, yeah. that uh, reduces its function. And that's the eustachian tube. Yeah, the, that show, exactly. What's, what's that? So the eustachian tube uh, empties uh, from both ears up above the soft palate, which is the top of your inside of your mouth, and equalizes the pressure. It's what uh, occurs on airplanes. If your eustachian tube is not wide open, then you get pressure problems when you go up in an airplane or up in the mountains. That can also produce uh, some hearing loss uh, because of eustachian tube dysfunction. Usually, though, uh, that's transitory and uh, can be helped, you know, by trying to equalize the pressure like you do in the airplane. Or I, yawn, that type of thing. Or thing. yawn. Well, where's the eustachian tube here? Uh, oh, that's this right here. Right. You mean this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's connected to the, the middle ear. Uh, which is right behind the eardrum. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, there is, and I, I, I sometimes uh, people get the wax out of their ears and suddenly the problem, uh, a, a lot of problem goes away, but it isn't generally no hearing. Yeah. Yeah, there's something else happening. Uh, female, uh, methyl, uh, methyl anatetrahydrofolate reductase, MTH, FR. Are the doctors familiar with this, and do they have an opinion as to whether a patient should undergo the testing for it? Well, that's, that's a, an a enzyme defect that's familial that increases your chance slightly of getting blood clots. I think it also interferes with your chances of having a successful pregnancy, if I'm not mistaken. This is a... a Rick, uh, Dr. Holm may know more about this than I do. This is kind of out of, uh, as I was telling uh, Rick earlier, the average age of my patient is 77 now. I don't see many people who are afflicted by this particular yeah. problem. I, I don't longer. either, and it amazes me that you knew this because I didn't know that one. But it uh, certainly, if they are trying to have a pregnancy, there's some blood thinner kind of treatments that people can right. be on. And if they've uh, had clots, this is one of the uh, hereditary defects that people look for to see if you're predisposed. Um, so uh, any th any supplements, uh, as long as we're talking, let's see, where are we got? Oh, oh, we've got more questions. Let's just run through these questions quickly. Right. Uh, via email, I do not smell anything, even a skunk. I wonder if I do, I, I could do something to help. I think uh, uh, some of that might be uh, you know, certainly allergic things. And I like the idea of an antihistamine and a steroid nasal spray, nasal cort and uh, Allegra. And mm -hmm. put that combination together and uh, get off of zinc. I had a guy come in who was taking zinc supplement and uh, he was losing his smell. And I had him stop the zinc and his smell came back. Had you ever heard that one? No. All right. Um, I won't forget it. Make though. sure uh, that you're off the zinc supplement. I had shingles on my eye last year at 40 years old. Look at your, uh, by the way, look at your, your uh, multiple vitamin. Uh, and I dumped that <clears throat> right now. Just no supplements, no supplements for a while and see if your smell comes back. I had shingles on my eye last year at 40 years of age. I know they recommend the vaccine at 50. Should I get the shot early since I got the virus so young? What's your take on the shingles? Vaccine? Well, we used to think uh, that the shingles vaccine was a lifetime immunity. It now turns out that it's probably, oh, maybe six, eight, 10 years of immunity 
effectively. So if you've had shingles, uh, you can expect to have a fairly robust immunity for maybe a half a dozen years. So I don't think it matters uh, when you take the shot uh, from the standpoint of getting adequate immunity for those six or eight years, but probably I'm guessing in the future the recommendation will be uh, that you get it repeated uh, more than once during your life. And now the most uh, cost-effective time is in your early 60s uh, to get it because that covers, it gets more and more frequent and more and more severe as we get older. Well, and painful. And painful. Uh, I, if I was this woman, I would wait a half a dozen years and then I would get another, uh, then I would get a Zostavax, the shingles vaccine. Uh, I'm not sure that that's etched in stone as a recommendation, though. I'd be interested to hear what Dr. Holmes says uh, about I, that. I agree with that, although I know that they're seeing more and more uh, as you're younger. But the problems arise when you're older, and, and that's why I think at 60 she should definitely do it. But she had it in her eye. Oh, it's bad uh, luck. I would say maybe I'd get it at 50 and get it at 60. I mean, what's the $200? Uh, and, and maybe yeah. your insurance would cover it, but I'd do it. Her insurance might at 50. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is Proctalgia Fugax? <laughs> <laughs> and is, I there said, is this a patient? How did they know that? <laughs> uh, Proctalgia Fugax is uh, rectal pain, usually occurs at night, very severe. It uh, goes away spontaneously. You can sometimes get it to go away if you sit in some warm water. It's a pelvic uh, muscle spasm is the way I understand it uh, and uh, doesn't require any treatment. Uh, I'm not, I can't remember if there's any, I think pretty much by the time you access any treatment that would be effective, it would probably it's have dissipated. Gone. But Yeah, well, I, I get leg cramps uh, periodically in the night with in the calves. You know, they go into spasm. And the moment I can feel it coming on, I stretch it. The problem so is, how do you I, do can't have, I, have, I can't figure out how to stretch that <laughs> rectum, though, except maybe have a bowel movement. I, I don't yeah. know. I, good idea. I wouldn't put my finger up there. I it guess is the, well established. <laughs> it's not rare, but it's not common. Yeah, I think sitting in the hot water or taking a hot shower might be a good idea. Or cold. Maybe cold yeah, takes, yeah. The, takes the, um, the spasm. A uh, 79-year-old Rapid City was just diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis in July. They do another CAT scan to determine the prognosis. What can she expect if the prognosis is poor? There, there are several different kinds of pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, I'm guessing this is primary pulmonary fibrosis that you're describing. Uh, it uh, is variably progressive but tends to be progressive and uh, can in the long term have a poor prognosis. However, there are just recently some new medications that have been shown to be effective by reducing the tendency for more scar tissue, more fibrosis to occur in the lungs. So I think there's a, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel for people who have pulmonary fibrosis. Ultimately, a younger person might end up with a lung transplant at 70. Uh, you know, that would be a hard decision to make. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, 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 this is commonly called idiopathic yeah. because we have no idea why it's occurring. Right. And, you know, in 20 or 30 or 40 years, they may say, oh, well, all along we knew it was a fungus and yeah. here's the treatment. Or all along it is an immune system thing. We treat it with this, you know, the immunotherapy. Uh, but we don't know what it is right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what you said was very important. This person is going to have a, uh, a, a, a estimate of this fibrosis getting worse by how bad it changes. And then they're going to say, well, this is your course, and there's nothing we can do. And uh, I, would, I, would, I would say this. Uh, it's variable. We don't know for sure. Yeah. So I think I would follow what the pulmonologist said. I would definitely, you know, he, he or she may put you on a steroid. Uh, well, and I think they may. Uh a pulmonary person, if it looks to be progressive, they may put you on a new treatment that may be effective. Too. Right. There's, there's new things. 88-year-old woman from Watertown has had two knee replacements 12 and 15 years ago. Knees are very achy. Will cortisone shots help? Anything else to, to do to alleviate the pain? I think uh, Rick had uh, 
uh, must have been, was it last week or last month, uh, two orthopedists on, and one of the orthopedists, I thought, uh, uh, handled this particular question very well, and I think the, the secret is to figure out why the knees hurt. Uh, is it a, uh, a knee replacement that is worn out? It needs and a plastic replacement. The plastic it needs to be replaced. Is it some sort of tendonitis that uh, could be treated in some other way? Is it an infection? This would be rare at, the, at this time frame that it would be an infection. Uh, and those orthopedists, when they have a foreign body in a joint, uh, they're very hesitant to give cortisone shots. Right. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm a. I think that we we probably don't do enough cortisone shots for osteoarthritis in the elderly. I think we could do more of them in a plain old osteoarthritis. If there's been a knee replacement, I never inject. Do you? No. No. Um, via email, I have a fatty tumor about the size of a silver dollar. Sometimes it's very painful. Most of the time, not. What would be the out downside of having it removed? Quick answer. Nothing. No downside. No downside. But I, I've got a functional fatty tumor on my back. You know what a functional what? fatty no, tumor I is? No, I don't. <laughs> it's a fatty tumor that I use to teach everybody who has a fatty tumor that it isn't anything to worry about, and I generally leave it alone. Uh, what is the prognosis of glioblastoma multiforme tumor? So why is it so poor? I do not know why it's poor, but it is poor. And this kind of goes back to the pulmonary fibrosis thing. Uh, uh, there are uh, new treatments being attempted for glioblastoma. Polio injections, in, in fact. You know, in all bed. kinds of things. And hopefully we'll soon find something that is uh, significantly effective. I mean, we have some things that help a little bit. And obviously, you usually end up with a resection and some radiation therapy. But that's about all I know. We're on the cutting edge because there's some new things. I mean, they, I had a head and neck guy come in, and he was just thrilled because they're injecting malignant tumors that are metastatic from head and neck with certain viruses and seeing uh, cures. 79-year-old male, soft lump inside the throat that looks like a popcorn cottage cheese. Can remove it and it comes back. Has heard of tonsil stones but not sure what it is. Seen an internist want to remove tonsils but he didn't let them. What's your opinion? So he's got crips. He's yeah. got this crips on the tonsil. What's your take on this? Uh, I, I had these when I was younger. Uh, they uh, give you bad breath sometimes, uh, but otherwise I don't think they have uh, any significance. Sometimes you can, if you have one of those uh, uh, things that shoots water to help clean your teeth out, you can sometimes evacuate the crypts with a little water gun. Okay, real quickly, I have a great deal of pain due to spinal stenosis, arthritis, my GP pre prescribed naproxen. Uh, I'm, I'm starting, uh, taking one in the morning, one at bedtime. It's given me uh, a relief where other meds did not. I'm certain about side effects, thoughts. There's a lot of side effects with naproxen, burning holes in the stomach, hypertension, but it can give some great relief. Kidney disease. And, uh, you know, you protect your stomach uh, and you uh, monitor your uh, renal function. Very good. We'll be right back after this. When you quit smoking, you get extra cash in your pocket right away. Yeah. One month and you've got 150 extra bucks you didn't have before. Quit six months and you have an extra thousand. Oh. Two grand in a year, four grand over two years, and a whopping $10,000 in five years. Nice chunk of change. So take a deep breath. You can do this. We can help. There's probably no more urgent diagnosis in general medicine than when people are having trouble catching their breath. This accounts for about 5% of all emergency room visits and about 50% of all admissions to the hospital. Most challenging is that breathlessness may be anywhere from a low risk problem to one life threatening. He came into the emergency room with the feeling of impending doom, chest pressure radiating into his neck, down his left arm, and he couldn't catch his breath. The blood clot in his coronary artery was diagnosed by history with a little help from an electrocardiogram, and his breath came back after a clot-busting IV drug. The college student came to the emergency room dramatically short of breath and had a normal lung exam, chest x-ray, and blood tests. She was emotionally overwhelmed by impending finals, 
And when we walked her in the hall, she felt better and her breathing calmed down. The trucker had noticed his legs swelling for a week, and now he couldn't catch his breath. The life-threatening pulmonary emboli, or blood clots from leg to lung, were proven by lung CAT scan and effectively treated with anticoagulation. The young woman had a remarkable pale white face and was extremely short of breath. Profound anemia was proven by blood test and leukemia by bone marrow test. She lives a normal life now 20 years after her bone marrow transplant. The 12-year-old struggled with deep and rapid breathing. The air around her smelled fruity. Her lungs sounded clear by stethoscope. The blood test found high blood sugar, and her blood test for acid was high. Diabetic ketoacidosis was resolved over eight hours with insulin, and her breathlessness went away. The 70-year-old lifetime smoker came down with influenza given to him by his four-year-old non-immunized grandson and his usual breathlessness occurring with any exertion worsened to the point that he was breathless just laying there. He died after three weeks of intensive care, steroids, antibiotics, even being placed on a respirator. I was a grade school kid having difficulty breathing and sleeping at night as the blossoming tree pollen blew across my bed. It was my prairie doctor from DeSmet who heard my story, listened to my heart and lungs, correctly diagnosed asthma, and provided the inhaler medicine that gratefully allowed me to sleep. The causes for breathlessness span almost all the organ systems of the body. One symptom potentially due to many problems. If you can't get your breath, you need to get some help. Believe it or not, On Call with the Prairie Doc has been broadcast for 13 seasons on South Dakota Public TV. We still have three new shows for this season, and then the best of On Call with the Prairie Doc Encore presentations begin for the summer. We have a busy off-season plan that we hope will improve our show for season 14, which begins in late August. Thank you for watching On Call with the Prairie Doc. We hope that tonight's episode and every episode empowers you to work with your medical providers to better manage your health care. You are the most important player in your own personal health management. And maybe that is ultimately the best takeaway for everyone each week. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. The difference among prescription medicine, over-the-counter treatments, and supplements. Do they work, or are they a fraud? Supplements, facts, and fiction. Next time, on call with the Prairie Doc. Welcome to On Call After Hours, where we answer the questions we weren't able to get to during the broadcast portion of our show. All of your questions are important to us, and we want to, an uh, to answer as many as we can for you. So here we go. This is a male, has a severe allergy to corn. Do the docs know of a treatment for osteoporosis that's not corn-based? Have you heard that corn-based osteoporosis treatment? Well, I, I haven't heard of any that were corn-based, to tell you the Yeah, truth. I didn't know that they were. I think most of the medications that we give are not corn-based. Fosamax corn-based? I don't think so. Well, Perlia? Yeah, no. Perlia. Don't think Perlia no. is. Um, vitamin I, D? Yeah, I, I prescribe vitamin D 
sometimes calcium uh, supplements, but mostly just vitamin D and exercise. I've right. really not been quick to use the Fosamax in those meds. No, and I think that uh, if you don't actually have osteoporosis or a fracture uh, that uh, you didn't deserve, you probably shouldn't. I think it's overdone. Yeah, I think it's overdone. 64-year-old woman, right hip aches at night, not during activity. Also, on occasion, have a pulsing pain down the front of the right leg while laying down. What could be causing the pulsing, pulsating pain and the right hip pain? That's very interesting. Right hip aches at night, not during activity. Do you have any idea? I wish I had the orthopedist from last week on. Huh? Yeah, I think uh, that person probably needs a brief examination. To yeah, needs to go. Uh, you know, that um, I, I think that it's, uh, it's sort of like uh, a ligamentous or a menis meniscial uh, thing. Sometimes it's worse laying down. I, yeah. I don't have a good answer. Do you? No, not yet. We'll, we'll find it. <laughs> we'll get her on examination. 71-year-old woman cannot be in the sun for more than 10 minutes. We'll start burning skin after a while. We'll develop severe headaches, nausea, fever. It's been going on for 25 years. Had chemo in 86. Does he have anything to do with the sun? Um, I hope you know the answer to this. Well, I'm thinking uh, lupus. You know, I, I worry about mm -hmm. solar uh, sensitivity and um, hypersensitivity. It may not be... Uh, any of that. I mean, there's also um, porphyria kind of things. Yeah, but that's not a, I mean, that would be more chronic. She would have that even if she wasn't out in the sun on You're a right. chronic, chronic basis. Yeah, so no. You may be right. That, it could be a... Lupus. Go to your doctor and, and, and throw that question at her or him and see what uh, they say. 57-year-old diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension recently, referred to cardiologist for follow-up appointment is five weeks out. What can be done for symptoms of exhaustion until seen by a cardiologist? Yeah, I, uh, this problem, pulmonary hypertension, uh, assuming this is primary pulmonary hypertension as opposed to some secondary problem due to cardiac valvular disease or something, uh, used to be a really serious uh, therapeutic problem. It has now become much easier to treat uh, several different agents that are useful, uh, but I don't think there's anything that uh, she can do, or he, uh, I assume it's probably it's a she. she. Uh, I don't think there's anything that she can do until she sees a cardiologist, uh, but I do think that uh, five weeks out for an appointment if you're symptomatic is it's probably too long. Too long. Yeah, uh, push your doctor to get you to the cardiologist sooner, or, uh, and I don't know if, uh, Getting started on sildenafil, 20 milligrams once or twice a day, is is something that your primary care could do. I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't have enough experience. I would say uh, for that's, myself. Sildenafil is Viagra, and what they're doing is they're treat. There's a generic Viagra called sildenafil, and they can bring it to you at 20 milligrams a uh, dose. Uh, personally, I, I'm using generic sildenafil, 20 milligrams. It's been used for hy uh, pulmonary hypertension for guys who are looking for erectile dysfunction, you know, because it's a cheaper option. But pulmonary hypertension, sildenafil, you know, and ask your primary doctor to help you or get you in sooner, I think. Yeah. 71-year-old woman from Watertown wondering, there are any effective treatments for osteoporosis? We, we just talked about yeah. it. Several effective treatments. Yeah, but exercise is the most important. 76-year-old woman with Yankton would like to know what the docs think of people over the age of 75 taking cholesterol-lowering medicine, or do they have an age at which they should quit taking cholesterol-lowering medicine? We may disagree on this one. If, if there's a good reason to take it and your life expectancy is more than two or three years, there has been shown to be a reduction in cardiac and cerebral vascular endpoints if you take uh, lipid-lowering therapy. I think. Uh, uh, I might say the new 75 could be the old 55 in a way. Uh, if somebody had a serious problem, either with risk factors or previous vascular disease, I wouldn't hesitate to give it to them at least to see whether they tolerated it okay. Are you going to argue with me? I am. Because as you get older, the side effects certainly go yeah. up on the lipid-lowering drugs. And my comment is those numbers have been 
those numbers have been greatly expanded by the people selling the drugs. Oh, and that's I, for sure. I think the difference, you know, you if you haven't had an event, it's like you're not 75 yet. That's your that's problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I get to it. But if you've had a heart attack or you've had a stroke, okay, maybe. But you have to treat 28 people before one has benefited. Yeah. And and the risks are significant. You know, memory yeah. loss being one of them. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm not, I, you know, get exercising, get out of your couch. That's way more important. Well, a glass of wine probably is way more important. Yes. If, unless you have an alcohol problem. Yes. You agree? I, I agree, but you could do both of those things. Yes, you could. <laughs> All right. 71 year old female from Platt would like some information on the sciatic nerve disorders associated with it. Has been to docs and chiropractors and PT and it still gives her pain in the upper buttocks down the lower leg. If it's really a sciatic problem, which generally means that you have a compression of the sciatic problem, there are very few things that you can do outside of the body to make it go away. Uh, so uh, if indeed you can prove that you have a compression neuropathy, uh, either it goes away with time or you have to remove the compression in some way. Yeah. You know, that's a tough one because back pain, surgery to take away pain doesn't always work, but it sometimes is. And like 80% of people who've had back pain who have surgery will get relief. 80% of people who don't have surgery will get relief, you know, but sometimes... And I think that the cue is if what you have is back pain, uh, then Dr. Holmes is exactly right. You don't do surgery for back pain uh, if you can avoid it. If you actually have radicular pain or sciatica, your chances of it getting better are much greater than if your primary problem is in your back. And if you start to lose function in that leg, your foot's dropping or you're losing muscle strength, yes, then you need to have surgery. I mean, those are times when you really do move on that, right? Yep. Do you agree? 64-year-old uh, male from Huron, severe case of lymphedema with a lot of discharge, is morbid obese, lots of itching and burning. Personal doc tells him to lose weight. He knows he should, but in the meantime, do docs know any ways to relieve the pain and burning? Well, uh, you could have a complication of the lymphedema if you have uh, cellulitis. Uh, uh, you may need uh, antibiotic treatment. Uh, compression is not uh, as effective for lymphedema as it is for the edema that we get from just retaining but fluids. But I think this isn't lymphedema because he's got drainage. He's yeah, got and it may, that may be a misnomer, in which case if it's not lymphedema but regular accumulation of fluid, compression. then it's compression. And elevation. Yeah. If, if, if you elevated that leg above the level of your heart and you compressed it with an ACE wrap, or a support hose like 18 to 22 pound to the knee. That'll bring it down. Absolutely. And then your, your, your wound can heal and the drainage would stop. And that's a big problem. I deal with so much of this. Yeah, lots. Lots of it. 75 year old male from Pier has been hearing loss and severe tinnitus, struggles to sleep, participate in normal conversations. Does the docs know any way to manage tinnitus? Uh, easy answer, no. Uh, I've had it for 30 years. Uh, and, and I see you have hearing aids. And I have hearing aids, which goes along with tinnitus usually, a high frequency hearing loss. Uh, did you get have noise exposure that did this, or is it inherited? Both. Both. Uh, I don't believe there's a good treatment for tinnitus. Do you know of a good treatment for you tinnitus? Turn on the radio and then turn it to off the channel, channel and listen to the and then let that help you, or wave machines, or in other words, cover up. There's no good yeah. treatment. No. Yeah. It's nerve loss. Yep. Yeah. Is there any help for people with IgG4? I don't know enough about that to answer the question. You know, I'm, I, I don't either. I would say immunodeficiency with, and need Ig shots, you know, and I, I just don't know enough. I don't either. Uh, for 40, and here's our last question. 44-year-old female from Sioux Falls with many conditions, most autoimmune in nature. Her AMA is 1280, now presenting with Crohn's or colitis. Can the digestive issues cause all of, of, of the other autoimmune dis, uh, symptoms? Could lupus cause a variety of autoimmune sy symptoms? So she's got uh, autoimmune in nature. I don't know what the AMA is. 
That's probably anti-mitochondrial antibody, which goes along with oh, uh, yeah. some of the Immune. inflammatory bowel diseases and, and okay. uh, hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis. Can, and the digestive dish issues cause all the others. I think they run together, don't they? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's a myriad of diseases. It's sort of like a rainbow kinds of things. Could lupus be a cause? Uh, yeah. Yep. Anti-nuclear antibody, ANA, and then the anti-mitochondrial is, uh, is related. Yep. Bill, I, I, I can't tell you how much well, I appreciate I you coming all the way from Omaha. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to give you twice as much money as I get for, for doing this. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a deal. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all of your questions and the opportunities to answer them. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Dakota Dermatology, the Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swift Tail Communications. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by the generous support of Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.